Last but not least, our final presenter. And before I get harassed for placing our singular female on the panel last, let me tell you that she selected her spot. She wanted to go last, so here we go. Please join me in welcoming influential industrial designer, 1974 graduate in art and design, Patricia Moore to the stage. Patricia. Patty Moore has been a guiding force for a more humane and livable world, blazing a path for inclusiveness through universal design. She is an internationally renowned gerontologist and designer and a leading authority on consumer lifespan behaviors and requirements. For a period of three years from 1979 to 1982, in an exceptional and daring experiment, Patty traveled throughout the United States and Canada disguised as a woman more than 80 years of age. With her body altered to simulate the normal sensory changes associated with aging, she was able to respond to people, products, and environments as an elder. She wrote about her experiences in her book called Disguised, A True Story. Patricia has been recognized by ID Magazine as one of the 40 most socially conscious designers in the world and was selected by a consortium of news editors and organizations as one of the 100 most important women in America. She is also a 2012 inductee in RIT's Innovation Hall of Fame, as well as a Distinguished Alumni Award recipient in 1982. She has lectured at universities throughout North America, Australia, China, Europe, Korea, Japan, New Zealand, and Russia. And we are extremely lucky to have her with us here today. Please give a warm RIT welcome to Patricia Moore. When I came to RIT, we were in the middle of the Vietnam War. Having a front row seat for the atrocity of war has become a surprise piece of work in my life. I um, am humbled by it. I'm honored to serve. I'll never touch a gun. I've never worked on munitions but I'm pleased to try and put lives back together when they've been destroyed by the ultimate vulgarity. For me, Kent State was very personal. I came here at the age of 17. My boyfriend, a photographer major, um, was number four for the draft. I was devastated to know he was going to die in a rice paddy for something for us as students made no sense. And you saw the beautiful illustrations just a moment ago that made the rest of America start to question, why are we doing this? And why has become a very big piece of my career. I came here thinking I would pay my bills by becoming a medical illustrator. I was supposed to be an artist, but I also had sort of a financial bent, and I knew I'd starve to death unless I could get a J-O-B, and then I'd be famous as a painter. <laughs> and I've always loved being able to create with paper and pencil and pen and brush and paint and ink. I thrive in those moments. Those are my quiet moments where every day I must do something artistic. But while I was a sophomore here, a group of men in suits came to the dean's office and I was sent for and I couldn't really think why I was being summoned yet again. <laughs> I'm Irish and I'm from Buffalo. The dean explained that these gentlemen were from Raymond Lowy's office in New York City. And if I was willing, they'd like to hire me. 
at the same time, I was realizing I wasn't going to be a painter, and I was seduced by industrial design. And so simultaneously, I was sought after because I was abroad, truthfully. <laughs> and a professor here thought I had the right stuff to be a woman in design. So my drawing changed, my art changed, and my life changed when I became an industrial designer. But typically as the only broad in the room, I realized that something was wrong with the formula of innovation in product development and what we were doing. And I began to ask, what about those other people? the people like my grandparents I grew up with. And when I told Mr. Lowy I was tired of designing just for people with money and people with capacity, he was enthralled. And he asked, why? And I said, exactly, why? And why not? Why aren't we looking after the disenfranchised, the people who are relying on us more than most to care for them and care about them. And when I was bold enough to use the word empathy in design, people thought I was absolutely out of my mind. And when I asked to go to medical school, Mr. Lowy said yes, but people started saying, don't you want to be a designer anymore? Because sadly, back in the 70s, we didn't think about a multidisciplinary approach to anything. And now, of course, I've lived long enough to see it as the only thing. When I was in character, I realized that the future held joys and trials, but that at all ages, we were going to want to be made able by design. And so I never use the word disability. I don't believe in it. I think we all have capacity, and it's my job to embrace yours and compensate for anything you wish. But when I was embedded in the USSR, I learned something about the world as a little buffalo girl that I never could have imagined. A political agenda that hurt people through no fault of their own and a political agenda that was so hell-bent on destruction that consumerism didn't exist. This is a hydrofoil that the Lowy Group redesigned under the Soviet detente agreement, and President Nixon, probably the best thing he did. But we were unable to get these things produced in the communist bloc or by USSR because they simply didn't have the will to change. And if I have any sense of failure thus far in my career, it's that we haven't gotten any further than this moment. With my work has come great media attention and that has been one of my most powerful tools. Being a voice for design and recognizing the role of design in all of our lives has given me an opportunity to ask a lot of whys and why nots and to change attitudes and directions. And it takes powerful friends. I've known Oprah since she had an afro. <laughs> and she got one again recently. And I've worked with people with very deep pockets like the Farbers, to start companies that did smaller things, but in a way, major moves to help people care for themselves. To be able to cook your own meal because you have utensils that your arthritic hand can hold. And every time I meet a child through an anomaly of birth or an injury or illness, I'm always reminded that their work is play and my job is to make sure they have a lot of fun. And I would never 
be so bold or stupid as to point to a child, ridicule any person of all ability, and say there's something wrong with you, or you're handicapped, or you're disabled. By design, we give people the choices so that they can have control over the quality of their life. I can think of nothing to be more proud. These are hospital environments that we make for people of all ages, so they can relearn the skills that they lost to those illnesses and injuries. Where we normalize healing in a consumer world. But as I hinted, the toughest job I've had to date is working with our wounded warriors all over the world. My work with NATO has taught me one thing, the human spirit never dies. And even those of us who have been most injured today have opportunities like never before. If you look closely, this Marine has two tools that my grandfather didn't have when he was injured in World War I. With the mobiles, with the computers, with the technology, we can combine soft tech solutions so that quality of life can be returned no matter how hard the challenge. If you know anything about Mr. Lowy, you know that he is known as the father of streamlining, and he loved trains. More than Sheldon Cooper, this man loved trains. I'm very fond of trains, especially when I travel on them, but I never saw myself as designing trains. I'm sure Mr. Lowy's in heaven laughing now because he's saying, Patrice, I already told you, you would do trains. <laughs> and now I do trains. But in being hired to do trains, I had one caveat that I insisted upon, and that was that my clientele would be the forgotten. The ridership that had tougher assignments in order to get on board. And so we've tried all over the world now to design for people who need us the most, to recognize without design in their lives, as it is in all of our lives, there was no hope for their success or happiness. And so I do trains, and lots of trains. And if you want to have a complete mental breakdown, do civil engineering. <laughs> I have one response in that arena, and that is we need more estrogen. <laughs> I promised Jeremy I would behave. As a baby boomer, I'm now one of those people that is taking to heart even more so than ever before the command that we give people an opportunity to age in place. Now, that doesn't mean become statues in our homes, but rather it recognizes the goal of giving people a casa, a nest, to call their own and one that they can maintain and manage for their entirety of their life. We don't have that yet today, and we're still a long way off. But what we see here at our IT and interior design and sustainability and in all of the work we're doing in technology gives us hope for the future so that we can simply live as we wish to. I've just completed a 10-year study in China where I went to villages to see how elders were being treated. And what, of course, we had to report, sorry, that was me. What we had to report was, sadly, we have people, this woman of 94, caring for children who can't care for themselves. And so once again, using age as a marker for any work simply makes no sense. We have to look at lifespan design and innovation for all of our days. And we have to pray for the elders of China, because what I saw, of course, the government doesn't want published. But just as it is with little girl babies, they are being killed with their grandparents on the basis of not enough means for care. And so we look to a future with the hope that all over the world, 
will recognize with technology the opportunities we all share. The digital divide is something that I work with quite a bit as well. I'm often reminded when I'm on campus at Google that I'm the oldest person there, and the students simply don't understand why I would be there. But if we don't get this right, if we don't get a digital response for all ages and all abilities, we will have failed. So now we're working with all sorts of non-invasive maintenance for health ideas. And yes, I'm chipped. I'm chipped because I travel all over the world and still our government wants to find me. So if in fact I go missing, they stand a better chance. But the big surprise for me and my greatest gratitude, President Monson, is the fact that here I learned to speak up. Here I learned to question everything. And here I learned that one person has the capacity to change the world. I'm known, known as a, an ambassador of design, and I'm happy about that. But the more I think about it, and it won't be me, I think we need a president who's a designer. I love my lawyer. He's about to faint in New York City, but we need fewer lawyers in the Congress and more innovators. I want a world someday where the joy that comes with the birth of a child is the same level of happiness that we can be enveloped in in our last moments of life. And sadly, what we have is a polarity that is unspeakable, that in our final moments, we are spending 90% of our resources to die and not to die well. The atrocity of war still haunts us. And even though we're being told there is no global warming, I'm an Al Gore girl. And I can promise you that I'm as worried for the polar bears as I am for ourselves. So let's hold hands and cross the street together and take care to be kind. But don't be afraid to ask, why not? God bless us all. <laughs>